Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Honor to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So tonight, what we are going to do, there are two distinct suttas uh, teaching uh, voidness. And this is really teaching what the Buddha was the way that the Buddha was teaching emptiness. Now, what I was briefly talking about before we start, I want you to know um, that there are some printed pieces you can get from me. I will email them to you if you ask for them. Okay, I will, I will send them to you. And this is a special sutta because when I was studying on the mountain in the beginning with Bhante, nobody was there <laughs> nobody was there it was Bonte and me and phil and his sister and then we had six college students the first year and the second year and then people would only come you had to come six and a half miles on dirt roads to get to where we were it was a difficult location in lesterville uh missouri before the present location so when I was learning with him, uh, I, I got uh, was working online and whatever happened online in the original uh, support group that we set up, uh, whoever was in there, that's who were in my classroom. And the reason that was set up originally was because I had no classroom and I wanted to see now that I've learned this meditation, now that he's trained me to do it, I wanted to see who I was going to play with, so to speak, who I was going to inter integrate with. And the issue was uh, there were not other people who were uh, you know, practicing twim at that time, there was nobody. And so um, one of the things that happened, there were two men, two, two practitioners, one was in Texas, the other one was in Burma. There was another one in, in China, but the, the two, in, the one in Burma uh, and the one in Texas. And Han Tun was the name of the Burmese practitioner who had been doing this, his practice for years. And Bhante had been trained in Burma. I wanted to uh, examine something that came up. And what came up was the question, about emptiness, because after learning TWIM and practicing the way that Sariputta was practicing, you see, we are working in an aware jhana. So we are awake and aware, and we are able to observe. And what happens is pretty much described in that Sutta 111, the Anupada Sutta. And that's what you can experience when you practice this way. But people were starting to talk online about emptiness and the great school of emptiness that was created by Nargajuna in cooperation with what was happening um, with the, uh, as the story goes, Nargajuna was attempting to solidify a teaching that the Buddha had taught. And there was, uh, today there's a lot of sort of debating as to what Nargajuna was doing, what he actually said, but we get caught with this word emptiness. So people start asking, what about this emptiness Nargajuna was teaching? We don't hear you talking about this. Where, where is this coming from? And I went to Bhante and then Han was talking uh, to me online and said, why don't we do it the way we do it in Burma? Why don't we take the sutta and we examine the sutta piece by piece and we try to examine what it is. So I was showing them earlier um, what I can, um, you know, in here, these are the pages from what we came up with and uh, what we were doing, um, what we actually were doing we were examining uh, the um, examining 
the sutta to try to figure out what did the Buddha teach when he was teaching emptiness before Nargajuna's time, what was the teaching of emptiness? Was it really emptiness? So this is the notes at note on the third section of this study. We divided the sutta into three sections, uh, section one to six, and then section six to nine, and then from nine, 10, 11, and 12 at the end of the sutta. That's the sections that are in the sutta. And the sutta is Majjhima Nikaya number 121. It is the Chula Shunyata Sutta, the shorter discourse on voidness. And when you get to the end of this, you get a surprise, okay? So right here in the notes, uh, in, I just wanted to read you this one section. The whole sutta is a graduated lesson in identifying what is presently there in the moment, how it passes away, and then uh, what is then there in the end. Practically speaking, it's about using awareness within your meditation practice to see clearly what is there and then what is not there and then what is there again. So you have this observation, skilled observation, a fully conscious, aware experience uh, without distractions, the happening. You're in a deep state where you're using this practice and the distractions stop happening because a lot of be is because of your attention being fascinated with how this is happening, how you are going down into the level, uh, down into the level where uh, the emptiness is occurring. So this is what the Buddha called um, uh, the descent into voidness. He refers to this in some of the other suttas you've heard it. What is the descent into voidness? Experiencing voidness is seeing something is there, clearly experiencing its passing away knowing that you are now void of every part of I, the Atta, and that there is still something there and everything is impersonal, very impersonal. By that time you're looking at this topic for the advanced meditators, by the time you are looking at this topic, you are very steady with your equanimity and you're very still and you can sit for an hour, two, three hours and you can watch this whole thing happening the way you're going to hear it. So this is a training for the final experience of Nibbana, which is when the student can see only what is impersonal and what is very real and nothing else is even uh, is else in each present moment. There's nothing there at the time. And the training takes you toward the cessation of all the surrounding thought activity. Everything is going to cease after this point. So you're doing this when you're working at the level of nothing is a good time to say to the student, go and take a look at this and see if you can examine this sutta, sutta very, very quickly. So um, let me come back to you. So I'm gonna just read through the sutta first and then we can talk about it a little bit. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sawati in the Eastern Park in the palace of Megara's mother. Then when it was evening, the Venerable Ananda rose up from his meditation, went to the Blessed One and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and he said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the Sakyan country where there is a town of the Sakyans named Nagarika. There, Venerable Sir, I heard and learned this from the Blessed One's own lips. You said, now Ananda, I often abide in voidness. Did I hear that correctly, Venerable Sir? Did I learn that correctly? Did I attend to that correctly and remember it correctly? Certainly, Ananda, you heard that correctly, learned it correctly and attended to that correctly. You remembered that correctly as formally. Ananda, 
So now too, I often will abide in voidness. Ananda, just as this palace of Megara's mother is void of elephants, cattle, horses, and mares. It is void of gold and silver, void of the assembly of men and women. And there is present only this non-voidness, namely the singleness that is dependent on the Sangha of bhikkhus. So too, a monk not attending to the perception of village, not attending to the perception of people, attends to the singleness that is dependent on the perception of the forest. His mind enters into the perception of the forest and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. And he understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of village, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of people, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of forest. He understands the field of perception void of the perception of village, the field of perception that is void of the perception of people. And there is present only this non-voidness Namely, the singleness dependent on the perception of the forest. Thus, he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus. This is present, and thus, Ananda, this is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. This is the first step of the reduction in the sutta, and it reduces out. Now, Ananda was sitting in the forest surrounding this uh, place, and the palace of Magara's mother is sort of an inside joke of, that the Sangha has, because when people read about this now, they think that these monks are in some kind of palace, and they will say sometimes to you, they're practicing one point of concentration, their inabsorption, and even though that the um, the elephants and uh, horses and livestock and everything and the people are in the palace, they don't hear them because they're in absorption. That's what some people will tell you, but those people are not privy to the actual story of Magara's. Uh, Megara's palace, the palace of Megara's mother. So very quickly, I'll tell you, uh, try to short, very short version of this story. But there was a merchant and um, Megara was his name. And he had a daughter who was um, learning to be Buddhist. And there's a whole story behind her listening to the Buddhist teachings from the monks and from the Buddha. And she wants when she marries into the household, she marries his son. When she marries into the household, she would like him to learn about this because other people in the household are learning about the Buddhist teachings. Okay, this is start. This is second. I'm sorry. And um, what happens? Oh, I love this thing. This is really awful. <laughs> Okay. I am not knowing how to make it stop. I'm so sorry. I did learn last week a big secret about phones. This is very funny. I um I learned I learned. I learned to do this and to do <laughs> this sister came in the phone. There it goes. Do not disturb. It's done. I learned about that. Okay. Anyway. 
this palace, this palace is actually not an active palace. She has been teaching her father-in-law about the Buddhist teaching. And what happened was that um, the, what happened was that um, he was so excited after he learned about the Buddhist teaching and became Buddhist. He was so thankful to her that he decided to call his daughter-in-law his mother, not his actual mother, Megara's mother, but Megara's mother was his spiritual mother. She became the spiritual mother in the household who taught the members in the household all about the Buddha Dhamma. So one of the things she did, because it was a very wealthy household and um, this, um, he decided to reward her once he learned about the Buddha Dhamma by building this place in the forest for the monks for a rains retreat. So these monks were in this place, the palace of Megara's mother is what they called it. But when they built this place, they built it just like a palace, beautiful, but without the artwork on the wall or any silver and gold and any dressing in the building, but it was theirs like a monastery and they designed it just like a palace. And so they called it the palace of Megara's mother. That's where they were. So in actuality, there was no elephant. There was no horse. There was no cattle in that place. And there were not servants in there and it wasn't a dressed palace. And that's the secret to this. It was just like a monastery, like a temple you would go in today. It was very, very simple, okay? And that's where they were living and, and practicing there or they would go in the forest. So he left there and when he goes into the forest, he no longer has the noise from the village or from this place, if the lay people were there, it could get real noisy. Sometimes if the lay people were all there on a celebration, it, he was gone away from the people and away from the village. Now he only has the sound of the forest. So this is what we call the first reduction in this in the sutta. And we keep going. Again, Ananda, a monk not attending to the perception of people, not attending to the perception of the forest attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of earth. And you can see in your mind now he's sitting down at a tree in the forest. His mind enters into the perception of earth and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution, just as a bull's hide becomes free from folds when it is fully stretched with a hundred pegs so too a monk not attending to any of the ridges and hollows of this earth, to the rivers and ravines, to the tracks of stumps and thorns, to the young and old trees, to the mountains and uneven places, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of earth. His mind enters into the perception of earth and acquires confidence steadiness and resolution. So it's basically saying he got very quiet. He went in and sat down by a tree. He folds his legs, puts himself upright in a comfortable position, and he takes in what the forest is now. He's pertaining to the forest, right? And he is very confident and steady and has resolution and begins his practice. He understands then whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of people, those are not present. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of forest, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness that is dependent on the perception of earth. He understands this field of perception is void of the perception of people. The field of perception is void of the perception of forest. There is present only the non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of earth. 
Thus he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus, this is present. And thus Ananda, this too is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. Again, Ananda, a monk not attending to the perception of forest, not attending to the perception of the earth, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of infinite space. Now we get a picture. He starts doing this practice and, you know, Ananda is an advanced meditator. He's in the fourth jhana and working in the mental state. So he's sitting in a firm equanimity while he's doing this. And, you know, the disturbance is he's letting them all go. They're all just being dropped off. His mind enters into the perception of the base of infinite space and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the forest, perception of the forest, those are not present here. And whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of earth, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of infinite space. He understands the field of perception is void of the perception of the forest. This field of perception is void of the perception of the earth. There is present only this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of infinite space. And thus he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus. This is present and thus Ananda. This too is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. Again, Ananda, a monk not attending to the perception of earth, not attending to the perception of the base of infinite space, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of infinite consciousness. His mind enters into the perception of the base of infinite consciousness, acquires confidence, steadiness and resolution. And he understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of earth, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of infinite space, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely, the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of infinite consciousness. And so he's able to get into these levels and watch them very clearly. He understands the field of perception is void of the perception of the earth and the perception is void of the perception of the base of infinite space. There is present only the non-voidness, namely, the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of infinite consciousness. Thus he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus. This is present. Thus Ananda, this too is his genuine undistorted pure descent into voidness. Again, Ananda, a monk not attending to the perception of the base of infinite space, not attending to the perception of the base of infinite consciousness, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness. His mind enters into that perception of the base of nothingness and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus, 
whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of infinite space, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of infinite consciousness, those are not here. There is present only the amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness. He understands the field of the perception is void of the perception of the base of infinite space. This field of perception is void of the perception of the base of infinite consciousness. There is present only this non-voidness, namely, the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness. And thus he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus, this is present. Thus Ananda, this too is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. So if you, I'm gonna write it down on the board in, after we finish, but you can you can write this out and you can see it very clearly in a chart, very simply by saying, first we start with the people and then we are in the forest in the, the in Megara's uh, mother's palace. Then there's no village and we're in the, and in, in, uh, in no forest and there's just the earth. We're sitting there and looking at the elements of the earth around us. Then there's no earth and no infinite, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, there's no forest and no earth and we fall into the perception of the base of infinite space. And then there's no earth and no infinite space and we fall into infinite consciousness. So remember the waterfall picture, I'm showing you the waterfall picture. This is where the idea for the waterfall picture came, where the waterfalls are coming down the mountain like this. And when they come down and they pour down into the next level, they have to fill up the hole under the waterfall to fill up and fall down into the next one. And so there is a set of conditions that must be met in order to fall from level to level to level. And that chart shows you one, two, three, four, and then goes into infinite space. This, this sutta starts with the infinite space uh, and then goes back in, in the infinite consciousness advances. Then with no infinite space and no infinite consciousness, it falls into the base of nothingness. And with no infinite consciousness, it falls into the base of uh, a no nothingness, it'll fall into the neither perception or non-perception. That's what we're up to here. So again, Ananda, a monk not attending to the perception of the base of infinite consciousness, not attending uh, to the base of nothingness, will attends now to the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of neither perception or non-perception. And his mind enters into that perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of infinite consciousness, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. He understands this field of perception is void of the perception of the base of infinite consciousness. And the field of perception is void of the perception of the base of nothingness. In fact, there is present only this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of neither perception or non-perception. 
and thus he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there is, he understands that which is present thus. This is present, and thus Ananda, this too is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. And see, this is perplexing when you read this one. If you haven't been to neither perception or non-perception, it's perplexing to read this, confusing. So how do you perceive something with, that is neither perception or non-perception? For those of you that are working down in that level, I don't know, but you should have heard it by now, but I'll say it again. You fall into a state where when you come out of that state, you sit there wondering, did I meditate or was I asleep? You're not sure. And what you're supposed to do with that when you reach this funny place that you're just not sure if you were sitting or not. This could be after a sitting of one hour, two hours long, uh, but you don't really know as you normally know that you were meditating, you just can't perceive it. So what the, actually what the Vasudhimaga section tells you to do, and it does, it comes across in some of the suttas too in the instructions for this, you, you are told to just be quiet when you first come out, sit there and close your eyes and just think, what did I, what happened? And if you see a pattern or you see a color or you see movement in your mind that that was in the meditation, the moment you see it, the moment you see it, you six R, you let it go, relax, you smile and come back and sit there and close your eyes again, keep going. Don't wonder what it was. Don't examine it. Don't analyze the, try to figure out what caused it or anything. Don't do that. Because at this point, you are reducing, reducing, reducing out towards the end point of where you're going to be able to fall into cessation. In this level, you are preparing your mind to reach the right conditions to be able to fall over into cessation. And so you don't question it, just you let it go, let it go and keep relaxing very quickly, okay? Then you get up and you walk very quietly, just walk, but you walk as much of a regular pace as you can and then you come back. You don't roll your sitting sessions over. In other words, do not sit even for 30 minutes and stop and go like this and you know then sit again. You always, always get up and move your body to get your circulation going properly in your heart and the movement, your muscles get everything flowing inside. And then you sit down and do another session, okay? After walking. Section 10, now this is interesting. Again, Ananda, not attending to the perception of the base of nothingness, not attending to the perception of the base of neither perception or non-perception, attends to the singleness dependent on the signless concentration of mind. His mind enters into the signless concentration of mind and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of neither perception or non-perception, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely that connected with the six bases that are dependent on this body and conditioned by life. He understands this field of perception is void of the perception of the base of nothingness. This field of perception is void of the perception of the base of neither perception or non-perception. There is present only this non-voidness, namely 
that connected with the six bases that are dependent on this body and conditioned by life. Thus, he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus. This is present. Every time he says this is present, he says it, this is what's real. This is present, totally impersonal, nothing to do. No, I, me, my, mine, no sense of Atta there at all. Thus, Ananda, this too is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. Now, in this part, it was very interesting for a couple reasons. First of all, um, your dependent singleness is dependent on the signless concentration of mind. If you go back in uh, 43 or 44, I think it might be 44, MN44, you're going to see exactly how you fall into uh, cessation and how you can't fall into cessation, okay? And it's spelled out for you in the, those suttas, 43 or 44, where the questions and answers are. And it's talking about signless states and sign states with, that are, have signs. And it's talking about turning off into, uh, turning off uh, perception, feeling, and consciousness is when you fall into the state of Niroda. And how you come out of it is when you turn it back on. So your mind, the mind object, is signless intention and direction is into the signless, meaning not paying attention to any anything that appears in mind at all, any movement, any vibration, nothing, absolutely paying not attention to anything that's signless. And then coming out as you're coming back out of that in the other sutta, we'll talk to you about, I put my mind intention toward the signs and that's how I come back out. Now we do that naturally when we fall into um, Unconsciousness, for instance, is a good example. And I always, uh, we met, I always go back to the experience of having a tree fall on me and going into falling unconscious and coming back out, you know, and your body does this automatically. And when you go into this unconscious, unperceiving, unfeeling state, it's very brief the first time it happens, okay? and your body is willing to turn back on very easily. As it turns on, this is where you get to see the little tiny um, tiny pieces coming back on from the bottom, like coming back on very quickly the first time. And those tiny, tiny little pieces, what are they? Those are the links of your dependent origination or your co human cognition turning back on. And that's what this is, that's what this is. Uh, pointing to, okay. And so when it talks about the signless concentration of mind, that's why it's speaking about that, attending to, um, attends to the singleness dependent on the signless concentration of mind, because you're almost at that point. Okay, and then the other thing that's interesting, at the top of page 969, where we were reading just a moment ago, is it is talking to you when you go into that state, what, what is left, what is still there, okay? And what is still there is interesting because what is there are the six sense doors that are dependent on this body and conditioned by life. So this is interesting, isn't it? Because uh, mentality, materiality, um, is based on you being alive when you're coming to be alive. And then the body, the six fold base, uh, the six sense doors come after mentality, materiality. And so they come back uh, on, that's the contact that's just barely there, okay? This field of perception is void of the perception of the base of nothingness, we said. And in the field, a perception is void of the perception of neither perception or non-perception 
it is uh, not only the non-voidness, namely connected with the six bases, six sense bases, okay, that are dependent on the body and conditioned by life. So this is also uh, telling you something about the arahat that's coming very quickly here in this sutta. And the arahat, what is left of the arahat is obvious here, you see, because it's talking about he has six sense doors, he has a functioning body, and he has six sense doors that are, are going to continue to operate. He is going to continue to see, to hear, to smell, to taste, and touch. So it's confirming that in this, and it is conditioned by life. If you're alive, that's what's going to be operating. Okay, and then the next one, 11, again, Ananda, a monk not attending to the perception of the base of nothingness, not attending to the perception of the base of neither perception or non-perception, attends to the singleness dependent on the signless concentration of mind. That's where you're pointing, pointing toward the signless state. His mind enters into that signless concentration of mind. You just fell into the cessation state with pure mind, no disturbances, acquires confidence, steady and resolution. He understands the signless concentration of mind is conditioned and volitionally produced. In other words, volitionally, volition, your will for this to happen, your choice to let go of the hindrances and just let them not feed them anymore, to let them dissolve, to be able to get to the state. This is the volition in the practice of the meditation volitionally produced is the signless concentration of mind it's saying so you produce it by we tell you don't do anything stay back step back step back get out of the way get out of the way you hear us say that so you can fall but your intention your aiming is to that signless state you see and part of your will to get there is to give yourself the proper condition to fall there okay that's what this is about whatever is conditioned and volitionally produced is impermanent subject to cessation so the signless state once you fall into it is impermanent and is subject to cessation and you will come back you will come back on turn back on when he knows and sees thus his mind is liberated from the taint of sensual desire from the taint of being, from the taint of ignorance. And you are, and you know, you know this. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It is liberated. He understands birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming into any state of being. Now, when you are going through the system as we try to describe it to you and we say this is happening a number of times on your way to the to the arahat ship you see i used to ask my students after we talked about everything how many times does um, a meditator experience uh, the state of cessation and coming out of cessation with the opening of the mind happening when he is an arahat with fruition? That's the question. How many times? And the answer is eight times. This means there are a series of mundane nibbanas that have to do with reaching sotapanna and then one for sotapanna and fruition one for sakadagami, one for sakadagami and fruition, one for anagami and one for anagami and fruition, one for arahat and then one for arahat and fruition. How do we know this? Well, we have descriptions of who is in the Buddhist camp or the Buddha's meditation school that is moving around India. Who is in there? Who is in the school? When we see how the school is set up, 
It has eight kinds of individuals in the school, not four. It has eight kinds of individuals. As I've told you, Sariputta is the mother. Mogalana is the nurse. Mogalana, te uh, uh, Sariputta teaches the new monk, first, second, third, fourth jhana. When he goes into the mental jhanas, he's turned over to Mogalana. He's working with the student or the, the yogi to get help him with any questions he has about infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, neither perception or non-perception and going through. That's when he needs to know something, he's asking the other students that are in his group. So there are eight groups are functioning with intention to get to Sotapanna, the next group to get to Sotapanna and fruition, the next group, Sakadagami, the next group, Sakadagami and fruition, the next group, Anagami, and the next group, Anagami and fruition. These are groups of students talking to each other. And the interesting part is when they're discussing Dhamma, when I keep saying talking to each other, uh, it's because in modern times, we're told not to talk to anybody about our practice. So how do we ever reach confidence, steadiness, and resolution if we can't talk to other people who are working at the same level trying to get to the next level. Hmm? And when we looked at that, we realized those students that go very quickly are working with us in interviews very closely as they're going along. And they want to know, you know, is this what happens when at this level at this, did it happen to you? And did it happen to you? Yes, and it happened to me the same way. And this is what gives you the confidence they're talking about. And this is what is giving them the steadiness and confidence to practice the way they're practicing for long periods of time. And their resolution to get there, to get all the way through is coming from that kind of support. Why did that fall apart? Why, why do you suppose that that fell apart in modern times? I said to myself, why does that happen that that disappeared? Well, you know, if you go to a teacher in a situation, if you go to a teacher and you don't get an answer and they just say, just go and sit and you'll get it. Just go keep sitting and you'll get it. Just go sit. And that's all they ever do. Eventually they're going to start saying, please, don't talk to other people about your practice. Please don't prepare notes. Just come and talk to me. But then he, the person doesn't have the answer. You know, even when we go to the person and say, what is craving? This can be, can, it, you know, tremendously frustrating. Craving is what's causing the suffering. But I'm only going to say it's desire. But I don't explain it to you. And I don't go any further. And I'm not going into the text. That could be tremendously, um, you know, destructive to the person's desire to continue with the meditation. And so, but the difficulty for us in in the school that we are set that we have set up in Twim, the difficulty is how many of us are there. Now, in Indonesia, they have done tremendously well. I don't know. I know they've done some things with all the anagamis and some things with individual groups, but I know they have so many people that have been successful, for instance, that they can talk to each other. If you're at this level, you can talk to another person, you see? But in many parts of the world, we don't have this advantage. If you go to Italy, maybe you have 10 students in, in all of Italy <laughs> living around, or, or Germany, you only have a few people. And, We've been trained so heavily in other uh, different approaches not to speak to anybody. We don't understand how to do this because we don't have enough examples here. So it was an important part is all I'm trying to point out. So when they keep stressing this, he keeps stressing what's happening to them in each one of these levels as he was developing. They're encouraging these groups to work as groups step by step by step. And it's all, it's very funny to me. All the charts go higher, 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 higher. But then we go to 107 and we see in the first few lines of 107, we see the Buddha explaining to Ganaka Mogalana, the, the accountant, that when he teaches, he teaches 
down the steps, step by step, down to the very last stair on the staircase. That's what he says. So these we know that they're going deeper, 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 quieter, stiller, calmer, all the way down. So it's kind of funny. All right. So what happens here is this is a declaration. Birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. Now, we look at what is happening with that statement is the Arahat statement, the stock Arahat statement. However, let's look at it a little bit more closely and see something. Because if we, we look at this and we say the birth, birth of craving, the birth of clinging is stopping because I know how it works. I'm using the six R's. So as you're going in these levels more and more firmly in your mind, you are teaching your mind to let go and instead of grabbing onto something and stopping what you're doing and examining the disturbance, um, you're taught, you're teaching yourself constantly retraining the mind. And this is the purification and the retraining of your mind. That's what Twim is doing or the Buddhist teaching in meditation. He's teaching you to purify it every time you let go, relax, smile and come back and continue your meditation. You are doing what? If you now only, it's only retraining your mind if you're building new neural pathways in your mind to go in the wholesome direction and build more and more wholesome, supportive things in your life. How do you do that? Okay, ask the question scientifically in the research for development of new neural pathways to the brain and behavior patterns, the relationship between the two, how does that work? And what they discover is repeating repetitive direction to the brain, the same direction every single time, 100,000 times until your brain gets it. This person is never going to grab on anymore and get involved with disturbing emotions and everything else to what comes up. This person's whole entire life, six R, six R, six R, six R, don't leave any pieces out, steps. And if you do it every single time, the brain will eventually flip. And I have seen students, we had a student in New York, we had one in Texas, we had one in California, I know there's one in Toronto. And all of a sudden something happens that always disturbs them at work and they always get mad or they're taking a walk and somebody drive by, drives by and harasses them. They always get very angry and all of a sudden it's gone. And they write and say, you know, it's gone. How did that happen? And I try to explain to them because you kept going through this cycle, like a washing machine doesn't wash your clothes differently every time. It washes them the same way every single time. It washes them, rinses them, and spins them and puts them out. What you're doing is you are recognizing this, you are, you grabbed a hold of it, you're, re, you're releasing, you're relaxing, you're smiling and coming back. And as you're releasing and relaxing, that's the letting go and relaxing part of the unwholesome stuff. And the smile is the wholesome input, okay? And the coming back and keeping going, there's the cycle. You see, cycle, cycle, cycle. But it doesn't work if you start doing it to the brain this way, this time, tomorrow morning, next time, uh, using another practice, mixing it up and everything. If we wanna understand what the Buddha said about that, just go back to, Majima Nikaya number 72, section 18, and see what he told Vajagati. See what he told Vajagati in his situation. I've read it to you before. I'm not going to read it to you again. And he basically, he doesn't, don't mix it up with stuff. It's not going to work. Just take what I'm showing you I found, and this really works, and just 
try this and do it for a week straight. In two weeks time, these students in New York and Texas and in Canada and such, they, they flipped and their mind is doing it automatically. And it's really fun. So if we look at this statement, the birth of clinging and the birth of habitual tendencies is destroyed more heavily each time you reach one of the attainments and a fruition and keep going and attainment and a fruition stronger and stronger and the holy life has been lived it means you took enough interest in modern times to stop and set up a meditation program for yourself where you're living maybe it's not in a temple fine maybe you didn't become a monk that's fine but you're doing it on a daily basis and you're keeping this system of train, 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 purify, train, purify, train, purify, train. That's what it is. What had to be done has been done. If you don't do it, it won't change. It'll just flip back the way it was before you started. There is no coming to any state, no more coming to any state of being. Now, being, we were saying, no more coming to any state of being. Being is the bhava. If we say that being means the bhava in the sense of no more habitual reactions. There you go. We say there is no more coming automatically to reactions like I did stuff in the past. I'm going to keep doing it now again. You know, um, I was watching something last week. I was really, I was so buried in everything. And I decided, okay, I have to watch a show for a couple of days, watch a movie or something like that. And I was looking at shirts and there's this one, one series on Netflix called Shirts. And this one character, he's just in a habitual humdrum. Uh, Louis Litz is the character's name. And my gosh, he's just, craving and he's doing this misbehavior and he's the same thing every time there's a problem in this little show this character this lawyer is just suspicious of everybody from the past this is coming through and hateful from something that was in the past coming through and screaming at people and that comes past and plays through again these are your habitual tendencies you go down and start meditating. I'm wondering who's going to come on that show and teach him how to meditate. <laughs> Stop everything and start meditating. But anyway, maybe it would help this character change. But he's really caught in a terrible situation in his life in that. So anyway, that only lasted for a few days. I, I, just, I was sort of glad that I was leaving life. I've left life so long. All right. Next part, the... Section 12, he understands whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the taint of sensual desire, that's lust and greed. Those are not present here. Remember, they, lust and greed and such, really involve Atta. And you've gotten to this level and gone through here with Anatta, no idea that. There's a personal opinion. You're not taking anything personal at all. Those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the taint of being. And remember, I'm saying to you, I'm looking at this, at the taint of habitual reactions. Well, those are not present here, certainly. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the taint of ignorance. Well, we went way beyond the taint of ignorance when we got through this sutta because we're examining dependent origination and the path at the same time and all things that are involved in the 37 requisites of enlightenment. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely that, can, that which is connected with the six bases that are dependent on this body. The six bases dependent on the body and conditioned by life. He understands the field of perception is void of the taint of sensual desire. The field of perception is void of the taint of being. The field of perception is void of the taint of ignorance. Now listen closely. 
there is present only this non-voidness, namely that connected with the six bases that are dependent on this body and conditioned by life. Thus, he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus. This is present. Thus, Ananda, this is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness, supreme and unsurpassed. Ananda, whatever recluses and Brahmins in the past entered upon and abided in a pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. All of them entered upon and abided in this same pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. And whatever recluses and Brahmins in the future will enter upon and abide in the pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. All will enter upon and abide in the same pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. Whatever recluses and Brahmins in the present enter upon and abide in the pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness, all of them enter upon and abide in the same pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. Therefore, Ananda, you should train thus. We will enter upon and abide in pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. Now, so you see in this sutta, this is the very last part of it here. That is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Ananda was satisfied, delighted in the Blessed One's words. So he remembered it correctly. He just wasn't clear on, quite clear on what he meant about this voidness. Now are you more clear? So Nargajuna, when we go and look at it very closely, I don't have my books about Nargajuna here, so I couldn't pull out the stuff I wanted to but for you. But um if you look at it closely, there's always a debate about what he was doing. What was he actually teaching? Was he teaching the Buddha Dhamma? When he did it, why did he do it and all that? And as I told you, Kalupahana did it, it came to the conclusion, Professor Kalupahana, that he did it the same reason Buddha Gosa did the, the Sudhimaga, to settle disputes and try to come together with one idea for an area geographically to be Buddhist. And he was very strong when he did this. And when we dig that back in the history, you're going to find disputes that were going on the same way they were going on at the time when Buddha Gosa did the great commentary, you see. So he was trying to be a peacemaker. And so was Nargajuna, okay? And we have to be responsible, you know? In 33, section 15, um, uh, there is uh, something here that always catches my eye about um, a statement. Let me go back here. Um, how does a monk smoke out the sheds here among, this is section 21. I'm sorry, it's um, Sutta number 33, section 21. And it's in section eight also, but how does a monk smoke out the sheds here? A monk teaches others in detail the Dhamma as he has learned it and mastered it. And this is how the monk would uh, smoke out the sheds. And earlier here, when he hears the Dhamma, he corrects it. When he hears it coming wrong, he goes back to the text and compares it and does it. The instructions are all in that sutta. If you wanna go back and dig it up, it's very, very, very good um, in the analogy that this is something the monks were supposed to be doing, but now, we don't always see that happening. We do see it happening with some of the better teachers. We do. But in general, I'm saying this is not something monks learn that they should be doing. Hearing it, and if you hear it wrong, you should stop and you should correct it and make sure the people hear the correct version. So you can, it's easy to get people mad at you for doing that, <laughs> you know, but it's something that everybody should be paying attention to. Every generation should be questioning and going back to the text. So when we look at this voidness, it's a state where all trained renunciation has been completed and the brain is working on automatic 
letting things go and there's nothing there so that you can reach this state of voidness. But at the same time, he's telling you in this sutta, clear as a bell in section 12, there's no such thing as emptiness. So those who are arguing that Nargajuna was speaking about something completely different that was emptiness. And the emptiness, uh, the, the pridefulness of some, uh, sometimes when a school develops, a school can become so proud of itself and so prideful, it's going to say, everybody else is wrong. This is what it absolutely is. There's no point in that. There's no point in it. You know, you get hated real easily and you know, you're just not politically correct and the rest of it all over the place, you know, with this. But at the same time, we have to be very careful of this idea of political correctness because we need to keep asking and questioning. And when uh, we are questioning, it should not be assumed by those who are listening that we are criticizing in a negative way. Because the truth of this whole practice that you learn is how do we know what was right or not? The only thing we have to go on is does it operate the way we're showing you and do the results help you to relieve suffering the way we're showing you or not? When the Buddha was asked in a conversation with Ananda one time, what is good meditation, what is bad meditation? His answer was simple. Ananda, if the meditation carries you down the path and you reach the objective, it's good. If the meditation is not carrying you down the path and you're not reaching the objective, it's not good. That's all he would say. He would not speak any more about it. And we can justify it by saying, yes, I'm going down the path, but it's going to take, you know, 10, 15 years to get to the first jhana. I don't buy it because we have the statement that we started searching for in the beginning. There mu he must have, did he find something? If he really did find something, what was it? And are the instructions there? When we look at the description of what we're hunting for. So we, we did, we had a description of what we were hunting for. When Bhante did this, he, he found it. And it's basically, akali, you know, um, sadatiko, akaliko, e ipasiko, opanaiko, pachitam, tabo wanuiti. That's what it is. Whatever this is, whatever you're trying to find to duplicate what he did, it basically was easy to understand. And it was immediately effective. It invited deeper inspection. You wanted to go and see how far the rabbit hole goes in Alice in Wonderland. You know, how far does it go? And you wanted to keep going to see where it would go. It has that kind of a pull on you. And the last part is the last one. Um, let's see. I can't remember the last one. <laughs> You know, easy to understand, immediately effective, inviting, oh yeah, untouched by time. So if it really was simple to understand and immediately effective, the instructions, whatever they were, if you have them correct, and correctly translated, or not just the translated, but correctly understood, then all of a sudden Satipatthana is totally correct. But if you take Satipatthana Sutta is a really good example. If you take it with the wrong understanding, it blocks you from reaching the results it's talking about at the end of the Sutta in the last pages of the Satipatthana. You go and look, you know? So uh, I love Satipatthana Sutta. It's a really good example of the problem we have right now. Because the first thing, the first books on Satipatthana Sutta, the titles were Satipatthana Sutta, A Direct Way to Nibbana. And then it was uh, Satipatthana, The Correct Way to Nibbana. And then the next, next five years after that, it was Satipatthana Sutta, The Only Way to Get to Nibbana. <laughs> but the problem was that those Satipatthana classes were having all over the place, but nobody's getting there to an attainment of even Sotapanna. And nobody was explaining why. So we're wondering what's happening here. 
And there's nothing wrong with the Satipatthana Sutta. There's nothing wrong with Maha Satipatthana Sutta if you clearly understand those instructions and what they're saying, they're doing and what needs to happen. But this emptiness, so you want to look, you, you understand what I said before we started doing this, I said to you um, this on this sutta, it's a lesson in reduction, reduction, reducing, reducing. The levels are going lower and lower and lower and lower. And the person is getting quieter and calmer. And the, the, um, the, uh, upeka is getting stronger and stronger and firmer and firmer around the person as it's happening. That's what I see when I look at this on a picture on the board, you see. Okay, open for questions. Anybody have questions about this? So we, we sort of took away the idea of, um, in the end, the last, the very last line, thus he regards it is void of what is not there, but as to what is uh, to what uh, remains there, he understands that which is present thus. This is present. So what are your thoughts about this? Ulysses, you have something? <laughs> you always know it when I have something. I was thinking about how that connected to the homage to the Dhamma. You know, you, you use the words, you know, sanitiko, sanitiko, akariko, basiko, opanaiko, et cetera, et cetera. And that means this, I mean, you know, well expanded, visible here and now, not delayed in time, invited, uh, inviting he, one to come and see applicable. Yeah, they do. You know, I'll show you something about that. The, but, um, one but about, I want to. What I wanted to finish saying is that is that it's for the it's for the now for the practice of this life to be realized in this life. That's what I'm getting out of this. Yeah, yeah. To be this well, okay. There's lots of translations for that. And when I was reading Karuna Dasa, okay, uh, Professor Karuna Dasa's book, um, I think it's what is it? Bhante Dhammagavesi's Foundations, right? Foundations of Buddhism. I think it is. Uh, 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 early Buddhism. What, what is it? It is early Buddhism. Early Buddhism, uh, right. So he goes back uh, as far as he can. And, yeah, and, and he tries to figure out what that was really talking about. The, um, okay. Um, and early Buddhist studies or he, something like that. We hear it, you know, uh, like the one that you just said is even different than the one I said and even different than the one that came before that. And um, when th there was one easy to understand for the wise, there's a lot of traditions like to say easy to understand for the wise. Well, we like that because the wise are the ones who can understand dependent origination that they can see the steps of how this is all happening. So if you have that knowledge and you're watching for that to happen, which you were watching that in this practice, he was watching that, those people are the ones it's easy to understand for the wise because they see how everything actually works. That's why. Um, so, and then uh, the, when the, another one is uh, a saint, an easy to understand, immediately effective, if you go to 107, uh, yeah, it's in 107, when the Buddha is explaining to Ganaka Moggallana, the accountant, he's explaining to him this teaching um, is a gradual teaching, it is a gradual practice and a gradual learning. Now, that gradual learning in this practice, because of what it is, is a gradual relief from suffering. That's what it's actually saying, see? So, um, and then the one about uh, that come and see, that's one of the worst translations is what Buddha, uh, Karuna Dasa was saying. It's the worst translation. Cause you know, I was victim of that. I thought, what am I supposed to do? Go up the road to the neighbor, hey, come and see, <laughs> come and see my Buddhism. I'm in the Bible belt, <laughs> you know, and I'm thinking, okay, come and see my Buddhism, not working so well. Abanti said, don't do that. That's not what this means. Hey, come and see what I'm doing. That's not what it meant. And so I didn't know for a long time 
And when I read Karuna Das's book, he dissected this, you see, in one of his chapters. And he says that one actually means um, uh, inviting you to deeper inspection. And I really like that because that is what we're doing with this practice. You're inviting the person to go to the next level deeper and, de and each one of those levels uh, is giving you certain elements and taking away certain elements and giving you new element parts. When you look at 111, you know what I'm talk talking about when I say that, yeah? When you look at that, um, it's um, inviting deeper inspection to see if you can actually see what happens when they describe in 111, when you go to, um, let's see, uh, how does it do this? It's okay. And the states in the first jhana and it, it, it's it, everything is explained to you what is happening to you. That's what we like about this practice. You have a, um, thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness. Um, uh, yeah. Born of a balanced mind or born of a collected mind. Okay, unification of mind just means this is what I'm trying to do. I'm not going to do anything else in life. I'm going to sit here, unification of mind. That's the first step in the first jhana. When you get to the description of the second jhana and the states in the second jhana, you have self-confidence come in. You still have some joy. You still have some um, happiness and a more of a unification of mind. Then when you get into the third jhana, when they get to that section eight, it's like it says um, the states in the, in the third jhana, some of those fell away. You have equanimity. You see what's happening? They're just giving you a breakdown of every single, every single level. And we gave you a chart with the um, jhanas on the chart. And if you look really close and you jot it down on a piece of paper, you see what um, the states for each one of them, how they change, some comes in, some disappears. No more comes in, more disappears until you're going reduction, 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 just like in this sutta, same thing. You're reducing, reducing out, yeah? So what is it that you like about that statement? No, I like it because there is this um, sense that this is not something that you need to wait three, four, five lifetimes for something, anything to, right. to happen. That is something that through development, it can be done in this very lifetime. That, that's that, right. Uh, you know, yeah, that, that's, that's really. I, and it's interesting because it, you know, um, this, well, this text I was just reading to you, that this comes from the the one that Biko Bodhi does on the, um, on the, um, chanting meditations um but um but it's interesting because um you know we are talking about the development here you know in this in in this twin this is what where, where we're actually practicing that so anyway I just I, it, that just jumped at me <laughs> it's like yeah, it's great. I, know I know what you mean anybody else anybody else ideas about this did you understand all of it uh did i did i stop too much or did i stop okay <laughs> was it okay the way i stopped for you somebody needs to tell me <laughs> you know because I, I didn't want to stop too much in this um and i think we did pretty well um the second one the maha Chunyata sutta is a little goes at it a little bit differently um, when you read through that one, it's a little bit different, it's a little bit longer. Um, but this one, the revealing point that you hear something that you didn't expect to hear, he's not talking about emptiness. And, you know, we're living in an interesting time because uh, we thought that space was empty. And we grew up believing in such a thing called a vacuum and we thought in a vacuum there's nothing and then all of a sudden MIT 
blew us out of the water <laughs> and said, wait a second, there's no such thing as a vacuum and space is not empty. And uh, I, I get, I have trouble taking, I had trouble with my uh, first two kids taking them to the museum in Washington, DC, the Natural History Museum to see certain things because my gosh, they changed. And I thought these were guiding pieces of the universe. And um, when I went to one science museum in St. Louis, uh, the guy had, um, he had like a, he had like a marble, you know, about the size of this little, can you see this little, this is like a thing for a bell, he's like a marble and he had it in his hand, he said, this is the beginning of the universe in my hand, that's, that's what is the beginning of, um, of my, um, the, 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 in my hand is the beginning of the universe and it's only this big. And I thought, wow, they're really catching up with the Buddha. <laughs> Finally, they're catching up. But when I used to go to the science museum, I never heard anything about that precise part so clear about the first big bang. You know, I never, I never heard that. And so now that they have amazing things you see at the science museums now that you didn't see when you were growing up, it's all changing. Mataji, I yes. have a question. Yes, Umar. Uh, you mentioned about the signless uh, concentration of mind as uh, the Niroda uh, state. So do I take it that this is the, the state of the samadhi, of the cessation of enlightenment itself? First of all, when you say samadhi, tell me your definition for samadhi before we mm. go in. For me, it's the same thing as going through the Rupa Janus and then through the Arupa Janus into the cessation spheres and all that stuff. But do you, ident you identify, do you identify Samadhi as concentration or do you, do you understand, uh, do, you, do you identify it as, as tranquil wisdom? Yes, as a state of, uh, state of collectedness, like the twin text define it. Okay, um, let me back up a little bit. Um, I see what you did, okay. Well, see the modern way of looking at samadhi is samadhi means concentration. And so we say collectedness instead of concentration. Okay? So you could, you could say samadhi is a collectedness, I guess. But I want, just remember if anybody ever confronts you on this, that the word for, um, the word that existed before the Buddha was enlightened, the word for concentration was ekagata, okay? And um, it was an interesting thing because uh, Rice Davies, uh, can, you know, he challenged this and he said, uh, this samadhi is a word that he believed the Buddha invented to label his practice and that it meant tranquil wisdom practice, tranquil wisdom practice. So ekagata, we can still say ekagata means uh, concentration if we want to talk about the level of our concentration, okay? But we, we should also point out that it's not too tight and it's not too loose. It cannot be very pointed and it has to be an open, but we don't hear a lot about this with, when we talk about it, but um, uh, about twim when we're teaching it but the most important thing is you're not looking inside like this if you see my hands you're not looking like this pointed when you're observing inside when it close your eyes you have a peripheral screen peripheral vision means i can see to the side here when you look straight ahead look straight ahead with your eyes you can see so far this finger when i move it out here to the right and that's your peripheral vision. When you close your eyes, the discovery practicing the way that we're practicing and you just relax, you have a big screen inside, but it's not a flat screen. It has like a circlerama, like circlerama with the IMAX. It's a circlerama screen that's going like this. So you can see things coming from the side up and across in front of you and rising up from the other side coming across or you can see something come up like this or you can see something up here. It's really quite something. And we have people who tell me they have to open their eyes when they're sitting because if they don't, 
they've, they'll fall asleep because there's nothing to see inside. And I can't even perceive there's nothing to see inside because I've been taught to keep watching. And if I keep watching inside, there's an awful lot of things to understand and to see. see? Okay, so, but so what is this uh, in the suttas that you were reading right now? in the, uh, the emptiness on Shunyata, the shorter discourse, it says, signless concentration of mind. Okay, it, let's that was the back. translation. I want, you, I want you to go back to, um, if you have the book, I don't know if you have it, but you go back to 43 and 44, and we have to find out, let me see just a second here. We have to find when you're going into the state, I think it's 44. Yeah, it's 44 because, um, Visaka was asking Dina questions in 44, and he was pushing it at the end. Now listen closely to, um, wait a minute, where she's talking about, oh boy, Dama Gavese, do you have your Majima Nikai? You got to help me find it. Here we go. Wait a minute. Maybe I found it. Okay, wait a second. I think it's 43. Is it in 43 really? Where did you find it? What page? No, I, um, I think it's the Mulagana Sutta, the, the, the signless, the signless. Maha okay, okay, then it's not. Ma Mahavidala Sutta, okay. Wait. There's one of these are talking about, oh, I could just explain it to you. The other Sutta, what it's explaining is when you watch yes, it's 43 it's 43 you, okay it's 43 what page is it on do you have the book yes it is on um in my edition at 388 oh my 388 okay 388 um 387 uh, no i i don't mm. No, that's why. Is it in the shorter division of pairs in the first, uh, I would say. Do you have a the title? First 50 discourses. Is there a title for the section? Called the, sh uh, the shorter division of pairs or the greater series of questions and answers. Greater series of questions and answers. Okay. In there, there's a description that when you're attempting to go for the deliverance of mind, here you go. I got it. Okay. Deliverance of mind is the section. Section, it's whoever's listening, section uh, sutta number 43, and it is section 26. Friend, listen carefully. Friend, how many conditions are there for the attainment of neither perception, not of neither uh, painful nor pleasant deliverance of mind? Friend, there are four conditions for the attainment of the neither painful nor pleasant deliverance of mind. The abandoning of pleasure and pain with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a monk enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana. Now remember, fourth jhana, which has ni neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. There are the four conditions. These are the four conditions for the attainment of the neither painful nor pleasant deliverance of mind. I can't come right now. <coughs> Okay, friend, how many conditions are there for the attainment for the attainment of uh, um, this of the silent? I'm sorry. How many conditions are there for the attainment of the silence deliverance of mind? Friend, there are two conditions for the signless attainment of the silent for the attainment of the signless <laughs> deliverance of mind. I feel tongue twisted. Okay. Non-attention to all signs and attention to the signless element. You got it? That means you don't pay attention to anything anymore that is coming up in your practice. You are totally at a point. Nothing is coming up. Anything that arises is considered a sign. And you're way past, anyway, you're way past sounds or disturbing you or smells or uh, tastes or uh, uh, touches, things like that, okay? 
These are the two conditions for the attainment of the silence, deliverance of mind. And the next question says, friend, how many conditions are there for the persistence of the silence, attainments, a sign, signless deliverance of mind? Friend, there are three conditions for the persistence of this signless deliverance of mind. Non, now this is suppose you want to sit in cessation, okay? Um, uh, you know, if you, um, in, down in Indonesia, there's lots of people who are in the um, anagami level who can sit there for hours in this cessation state. They can stay there. So this is the, um, the non-attention to all signs, attention to the signless element, observation of the signless element as you're there, and prior determination of duration. So when you go into the signless state, you must start by saying, I will sit in the signless state for one hour, or I will sit in the signless state for five hours, whatever you want to do, 12 hours. I don't care. If you get in there, you won't come out until you pop out almost on the dot if these determinations start working. There are, these are the three conditions for the persistence of the silent state of mind. So they're talking about sitting in it, resting in it. You can do this if you're badly damaged in an accident, you can do this and survive much longer. Okay, 29, friend, how many conditions are there for the emergence from the signless deliverance of mind? Friend, there are two conditions for the emergence from the signless deliverance of mind. Attention to all signs and the non-attention to the signless element. Give up your fascination of watching inside and begin to allow the thoughts to come up of coming out. Any, any kind of experience of coming out. These are the two conditions for the emergence from the signless deliverance of mind. Okay? You got it? Yes. Okay. So that kind of defines for you what he's talking about when he's talking about signless and signs and signless conditions. And he's pertaining to that last level. He's talking about giving up uh, or 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 embracing it either way, yeah, okay. So uh, it it occurs after you have gone through the state of neither perception or non-perception, right? No, the, before that. No, it's no you, nothingness. You can, nothingness. Well, you can start. You can start uh, in nothingness. You can. Um, in the back of your mind, Sarma, in the back of your mind, you want to have not paying attention to the signless states in when you are in nothingness. And as you're going through, you don't want anything to break in on you. You want to continue. The intention has to be very strong to go through to the point of cessation, right? Yes. Right? Okay. So it is when you're neither perception or non-perception, we don't really do much. <laughs> no, we, yeah, it's kind of how do you talk about that? You, you talk about it afterwards, like I was trying to tell you, you sit there at the end of the session and you note to yourself, what happened? I saw pink pattern. I saw squares. I saw bubbles. I saw a ripple go through. And the moment you say that, you 6R, 6R, 6R. Once again, it's a game of reduction, reduction, reduce, reduce, reduce. And I'm not there. It's just something that may have happened. But there's very, very little happening. That's why it's confusing in neither perception or non-perception. When you pop out, it's like, OK, the uh-huh, what happened? <laughs> yeah, is a question. OK. So Umar, does that help you, Umar? Yes, it does. But uh, I wanted to know about the deathless in relation to all of this. Oh boy. Okay. Deathless. Wait a minute. Where did I put that? I put this someplace. Deathless is like one, one of the things about when they talk about this stuff in the text. Okay. You want to, um, what degree are they talking about when they start talking about this now? 
I don't know. Did you have did you have an online retreat or how did how have you been re introduced to this practice? Did you have an online retreat or on site retreat, Umer? No, only just the text. Okay, so there's a lot that you haven't learned <laughs> in, in a lot of pieces that we would teach you when we're teaching you a retreat. Um, what I'm saying is when you go through a dependent origination class, uh, what I'd like for you to do is go to YouTube and pull up the dependent origination workshop and um, put up with the uh, purple nun. I was the purple nun. <laughs> There's a workshop. Go through the little workshop about dependent origination to understand that this is not just human cognition as it is occurring in our life, but it also has to do with the secret of how, where does the energy come from that turns the wheel of samsara, birth to death, birth to death. What is that? We have to go and learn that part of the knowledge, okay, to understand, to be able to answer the question that you're asking me, okay? Um, because it has to do with how do we look at dependent origination when we examine it and teach you in a workshop, Many people have thought, have decided to, to only consider this across three lifetimes, which isn't even Buddhist. You know, when you teach that to a person, you are kind of telling the person that that Sister Kama, who's here, is going to go and come back in the next life as the next life, the next life. But in Buddhism, there is no soul. I'm talking soul. When I'm talking about that, I'm talking about not just this body or appearance, but who I am is coming back again and again. But when you move over into Buddhism, you're examining the function of the mind, the function of the body anatomically, and the energy that is produced by the actions of the human being and the force of those actions the, were you here when we were discussing karma? When we were saying karma intention, then action, then ripening, and then fruition, right? So um, this big wheel, they're always talking about lifetime to lifetime. My curiosity was what, what pushes that wheel? <laughs> Why did they make it a wheel? Why didn't they build a, you know, you had three pillars of Buddhism, five pillars this way and houses and stuff in diagrams, but this turned out to be a wheel. Why did it turn out to be a wheel? And if it's a wheel, what is it that makes it turn? Well, in order for something to move, you have to have what's called torque. In engineering 101, you learn there's a, there's a gear and the gear turns, but to turn the gear, there has to be pressure and there has to be energy and pressure and heat and it turns this wheel to make the gear move, okay? So in this case, what turns the wheel, where does that come from? Where's that energy come from? And so when we look at human cognition, and we examine this dependent origination. We don't look at it across three lifetimes. Think about that as being the macrocosmic way of looking at it through three different lifetimes across time. Then think about a microcosmic view of human cognition, what's happening, how the person works. That might be looking in a super duper duper electron microscope that will allow me to see the firings of the brain and a hundred thousand of them happening in one second, running all the organs in my body and human cognition operating with this brain, you see? So what good, where I went with this was what good does the microcosmic view of this, even if I could be Superman and see this, what is the use of watching a microcosmic firing of the brain? And does that help me have a better relationship um, with you or with somebody in life? Does that change anything in my life at all? And it doesn't, okay? And across three lifetimes, I'd be worrying all the time, what am I doing now that's gonna affect the next lifetime forever? Is, is that gonna change my relationship with people and bring peace to the world? But the Buddha was doing something about, he was teaching something that is immediately effective for relief of suffering for human beings. And that does change things 
for people in lockdown, for people in families, for people in business. And that does move people through peace, to peace. So what were they doing? They were actually, we have the 12 links in dependent origination, but there are seven links that are the most important ones. And if you go to the workshop, you can go through those. But just to tell you what happens in, a, in the process of my sense doors operating, we would take the, uh, my eye, or just do my ear, somebody yells at me, I have an ear, a physical ear, that's my sense door, and the sound hits my ear, and the mental part of the operation of the auditory system to hear, the brain is involved, okay, too, and that mental part, that is the consciousness, ear consciousness. And that's what makes me to hear a sound, the simple version. We're not going to get in the anatomical medical terminology too much, but that's how I hear something when someone yells at me. Okay. And then with contact as condition of feeling arises, and it's a painful feeling when somebody, when somebody uh, uh, yells at you, it's a painful feeling that comes up first. We feel this in the heart and the head, heart and head. We feel this painful feeling. Okay, it's not personal. We don't make that happen. We don't have anything to do with it. It's an, it's an anatomical uh, function of the body. Okay. And then with the feeling as condition, craving happens. Now craving is the I don't like it mind or the I like it mind. And that translates if I don't like it, I don't want it. And then I get I get attached to the idea of making it stop. Okay, so in this case, someone yelled at me. Uh, I had contact. I had a painful feeling. Now I don't like it. There's the first personal opinion. Now this is starting to get personal. And now the moment that craving happens, you don't feel anything initially with the with the sound. Uh, and um, when contact happens. It's sort of like you put the key into an engine in a car, but when you turn the key, you feel the engine happen, happening, um, that, that's contact and then feeling comes up. That's the feeling of the engine running. And then when you say, when you say um, craving happens because of feeling, feeling is there, has to be there first. Then there's a decision that's made, a personal decision I don't like this. Now, when that happens, there's a jerk. You ever try, did you ever try to drive a car with a stick shift? <laughs> if you're driving a car with a stick shift and you're trying to learn to drive, they put me in a big field in a Jeep with a stick shift. And when you put the first gear, boom, you know, you get jerked forward. That's the first thing that happens. That's where the energy is coming from. When I personally get involved, there you go. There's an energy force. And then when the feeling arises, when the feeling is uh, as condition, uh, I'm sorry, craving as condition, clinging occurs. You know, clinging is when the story jumps in your mind, starts running around really fast. Mental proliferation, papancha. And when that's happening, there's more force in this engine, more power. And then with craving and clinging as condition, habitual tendencies come up. That's the bawa. And when the bawa comes up very fast, you reach for the past, find out what to do in this situation again, and you react it again and again. And that now everything is moving very fast. This is where the power of the birth and is coming on the wheel. You're moved with bawa as condition. Uh, that's the habitual tendencies. The birth of this action against this, what happened is going to happen now. And that's very forceful. And then at the tail end, uh, you have the aging and uh, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair about feeling so bad because you yelled back at the other person. <laughs> you didn't use your, your practice, you yelled back instead. Now, so what's turning this big wheel, okay? This wheel is turning because this is the dependent origination 
wheel, the wheel of samsara. What the Buddha concluded through deductive reasoning was, this is also the force that drives you from one birth, one human birth, over into going through death, oh, eight, um, what is it, uh, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. You get old, you have disease, you die. And then what that energy comes out of that person when they die and pushes them over into another birth. But you don't necessarily come back as Umer. <laughs> you come back depending on the energy that comes out of you, where you end up coming back in another lifetime. Um, and whether you come back as a female or a male, as a, as a rich person, a poor person, smart, uh, not intelligent, et cetera, and so forth, is based on the energy in the Kama story in the Chula Kama Vibhanga Sutta. It's what he's explaining, okay? So this, this is where you get this um, wheel of samsara turning. And if you go and listen to the dependent origination lesson, you can get a feeling for where that energy is coming from, okay? And the most important part of those links uh, happen from the uh, contact, let's see, contact, feeling, craving, clinging, habitual tendency, birth of action, and the aging and death of one event in your life at a time. This is cool, very cool, because it allows you when something happens in life to actually watch with the other person and yourself. You have the knowledge they don't know anything about this, but you have the knowledge and you can step back out of the movie, watch the movie happening and understand the links and see them happening in the interactions in events in your life. That gives you the power to stop and change from reacting with the bawa, taking the, the habitual tendencies and doing them over and over again to stop this, make it less personal, step back, cool down, calm down, and begin to respond. Do you get it? Is that clear to you, Umar? Uh, oh, it will be, but uh, thank you, Mataji, for that. Uh, for my last question, I just wanted to say that I emailed you on your Gmail account with my questions last Saturday but I didn't get a response. So I hope I can reach out to you through this message. And you, hopefully you, you send it, okay, send it again to me one more time. You send it to the Gmail, okay? The, that one, Kantikema2 at Gmail. Um, yes. I, know, I know I did a big one once for you. I may, have, I may have gotten exhausted and not been doing a lot this past week. Um, but um, I can try to look at your question in there again. Okay, I will, okay? Yes, one more question. Yeah, Sarma, go ahead. The essence of this particular sutta. I'm sorry, say it again. The essence of this particular sutta. Yeah. A uh, lot of people got confused. Yes. And uh, you, in the beginning, you said about Nagarjuna, Mahayana, Vajrayana. Yeah. And this is the sutta, the one person has indicated deathlessness. That deathlessness is the last stage of the person who got rid of the three uh, moha, raga moha dosha. Raga moha dosha. Yeah, but, three, yeah, three qualities. Yeah. Three qualities. Mm -hmm. Three yeah. qualities. And still he has the memories of uh, uh, mano imprints. That is a memory, uh, memory records of yeah. the past lives you have mentioned, yeah. even then he doesn't have a trace of any realms, earlier 31 realms. Almost he is getting somewhere you mentioned about Arahant, Anagami will be reaching this level like that you mentioned in the Sutta. Mataji. Oh, okay, right, all right. What What's happening here? Wait a second, I have to give somebody something, look. That deathlessness, sir, Please explain once again uh, in terms of uh, three raga, dosha, moha. Are you going? Okay, tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Um, you are oh, switching okay. to immediately that uh, uh, Paticca Samupada. 
instead Pro right okay still he has the uh, perception and vedana the, the issue here is when we're talking about deathlessness we, Sanya, uh, uh, uh. yeah all right please, when, we're please talking, when we're talking about the deathlessness um the, or the deathless just the way you have the um Paticca Samapada, and you can look at it from three different angles, microcosmic, macrocosmic, or the middle way. Our examination of this Paticca Samapada is taken, taking the Buddha on his words. We're experimenting by looking at all the different parts of Buddhism and saying to ourselves, if he's teaching a middle way, when he presents anything, we need to examine it more closely to understand if if um, what is the most operative way of looking at it in our life and the middle way of talking about the deathless is is talking about uh the uh the living the the okay the the small the middle way of looking at bawa for instance where your habitual tendencies live is to say um the middle way in the conventional sense, people don't, conventional reality and ultimate reality, okay? Conventional reality, everybody else that doesn't know anything about this, where they're living, they're gonna keep going to their habitual tendencies till the day they die. They're not gonna understand they're even doing it, that they're even living that way. The majority of the population in the world is operating at 85% or 90% of their life reacting and reacting and reacting in, in interactive situations, okay? But then the ultimate reality, when we're trying to look at how the mind actually works, how all this, what is the reality? And we actually formulate the reality ourselves. We make our own reality, our own experience. I, I use these words. I'm born and I have an, an a, a experience, this ex experience, this life in this existence. My experience of this life, my sister Kama's experience of this life is actually created by sister Kama. Sarma's reality is Sarma's responsibility to create each day. How are you going to look at things? How are you going to view? Them? We have that kind of power now. When we look at the habitual tendencies that sit in the bawa, um, the the death deathless means they don't arise anymore. The, they don't come up anymore. And the the interesting phrase in in the suttas that that beckon you and they call you and call me to examine this is when we look at the arahat's position. And the stock statement, the remainderless fading away and cessation of. See that? Remainderless fading away. Not just fading away, but remainderless. There's nothing left. A, yes. person can, a person can have hindrances when they're practicing. And we teach you how the hindrances work. Once you have that knowledge, if you're really seriously meditating and you have the correct knowledge, you shouldn't be paying attention to anything that arises at all when you're sitting. There shouldn't be any excuse for any sensation, sound, odor, taste, touch, sight that you would pay any attention to ever again. And if you don't, you won't be feeding them. And with because you have that knowledge, things are not going to bother you. How do you think the yogis are able to sit, uh, for instance, in... Um, in um, Bodh Gaya in the street for hours and hours and hours amidst thousands of people and just uh, meditate. Maybe they are doing absorption meditation, but I can do it too. I can let it all go simply because I'm not going to pay attention to them. I've done it at the zoo in, in, uh, with all the people around, you know, at, uh, in Washington, DC, I practiced doing that for a while. And I thought it was so cool. I, I know the people are there, but there's no attention at all to anything. I can allow myself to sense them the moment I sense them standing around me. I turn it off and just let it go and keep staying there. But I'm not going into absorption. I'm aware. See, so 
the remainderless fading away. Remainderless is the word, you know, something fading away. That's good. That's good progress. Don't get me wrong. If something was bothering you in your practice and now it doesn't anymore, that's great progress. But if you keep falling back and getting mad at what's going on around you and keep falling back, you have to stop and look at the mechanics of how this is happening. How are you getting angry at what's going on around you? And how can you change this? You can't change the other person. You can only change yourself. In, in lockdown, it's really, can be really mean, can, can get ugly, <laughs> but you, you have to let everything go around you and say, this is the way it is right now. You have something on your side always, Anicca. The Anicca is amazing thing, amazing thing. Anicca is talked about so much as causing this suffering because we humans, we don't like change and it's going to make us suffer when things change. But at the same time, many of my students right now are taking another view of Anicca. We understand that part, but now we're making Anicca our friend. Because whenever something's bothering you, no matter what it is, you should be starting to say, Anicca, 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 because you know whatever it is that's happening. I don't care what it is. It wasn't there. It started. It is there. And it's going to fade away. That's Anicca. So why get all upset about it? And you, you have power over this part. Nobody else has power over when you're going to decide to get upset about something. And you can just smile, pat the other person on the back. If that's how you're going to handle it, okay. But there's no reason to get hot about anything as long as Anicca is there. Yeah? Okay? Yes. yes. Now, Sar- Sarma is saying, what is this deathless? The deathless is when you uh, go to the Arahat ship, uh, level and you go to arahat and fruition what you've done is reached the remainderless word everything's faded away all the tights have been washed you completed all of the paramis there are all the paramis are completed all of the taints are completely gone because there's a remainderless fading away and cessation of them they're not going to arise anymore no hindrances are going to arise anymore to bite you you got it yes, okay yes. Okay. okay, now, so there's no energy when you die. I had something here earlier. What did I do with it now? I think, it, what did I do with it? Just a second. When, when you, um, when you are, um, I don't know where I put it. Okay, I can do it by foot. Um, you remember Majima Nikai number 143 is the training that Sariputta gave to, to um, Anatha Pindika while he was dying, Sarma, remember that? Yes, yes, so, yes. So what was he actually teaching? Now, I heard somebody was talking about, uh, I think Delson gave a talk and he talked about this is a way to let things go. That's right. But the reason it was so beautiful as teaching someone to die was this is a wonderful sutta for you to memorize for your life, get it inside you, recite it all the time. I will not cling, um, I will not cling to the eye, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the eye. I will not cling to sights. My consciousness will not be dependent on sights. Yes. And you well, see what? Yeah, now that's training the person to do what? To let go, let go, let go, let go, and not have any desire, any any kind of craving desire at all at the time they die. And if that happens, which is true of the Arahat, because when we look at the Arahat, his craving is turned off, his clinging is turned off, his habitual tendencies are turned off completely, mm-hmm. right? that true? So the Arahat still has, let's talk about the Arahat first for just a second. Okay, for those who don't realize that the Arahat still has a body. Yay, the Buddha had a body. Okay, had a body from head to toe. And the, the Buddha was still able to see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and to have things happen with his brain, with his mind, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Okay, all right. So he was still experiencing things just the same way as you and I do. So he sees something, he has 
feeling arise because feeling is part of the anatomical system, the nervous system, and the brain neurons and can be registered on equipment. So if the person's not awake, we can tell if he's feeling something sad or something bad or something happy. We can tell now with the equipment when we hook him up. So that's still operating for the Buddha, okay? But He's not craving. He turned off the energy of the craving, turned off the clinging, turned off the um, bawa, the habitual tendencies. He does have the birth of action still, but he has he does not have the birth of any unwholesome action, only wholesome action. You got it? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. So he's not creating any bad karma anymore. Not at yes. all. Okay. Now, in the case of Mogalana, he still had stuff from that time. In another yes, life, yes, yes, yes. The patricide, yeah, patricide, matricide, that was a heavy duty thing. Probably went through a hundred lives, a thousand lives. Who knows? Just came out, uh, two yeah. hours, huh? so just yeah, uh, remind me of time. Okay, well, we're going to finish this one part. So, Sarma, see, we're taking away the energy to turn the wheel. Now, the description of the Arahat that Bhante gives that's very good comes from the Vasudhimaga. And if you go down, you need to go down to the ocean. I don't know where you are, but go down to the ocean, get on the beach, and, you know, build a sand castle or build some kind of sand structure and build it, build it, near where the high high tide is going to come when the the arahat is the castle the person mm. is the castle and when the arahat builds that castle by beside the ocean when the high tide comes and the water comes and washes it away it is absolutely impossible to bring the grains of sand back and form that arahat again anywhere else as a being ever again See, but the normal person, when we pass away, simply come back through again and come back through again in different forms until we are basically end up being totally enlightened and reach an arahat and fruition state. And then we can kiss it goodbye. Yeah. Now, as far as if you want to do it, people need to let me know if you want to do this, we can pull out the chart and talk about what you're doing and after you die what could what's going to happen to you from what you're learning with this practice because when you even sit in loving kindness for um i can't remember but i think it's for a certain period of time you're going to be thousands and thousands of years in another lifetime that's absolutely wonderful a different type of uh that's joyful and there's no you know, you're, you don't have any problems, but you still have things you have to get through. And you still have to remember, like we make jokes about it. If you, and suppose you end up in a deva realm <laughs> and the devas have to be eating grapes all the time. <laughs> I'm not making fun of them. I'm not making fun of anybody. <clears throat> but if you're eating grapes all the time, you can't stop eating grapes, you know, and you have to keep doing that and listening to the music and hanging out with all the devas and everything's so joyous all the time. Are you going to remember to do your meditation? <laughs> it's the question, you <laughs> see. Or are you so happy that you're there? You So these places are not all just great because you have to remember if you're not all the way through, you know, and these are real long periods of time. I have them on a chart. We can pull the chart down and look at it. I can make a picture of it for you and show you. Um, but the, next, this next time we do. Yeah, it's kind of fun to look at that. Like, okay, what have I done so far? What good is what I've done so far? Where, what's going to happen to me that maybe we know from what the Buddha told us? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, got it. Oh, you already sent you the email. Thank you. Oh, what was that? I said, uh, I already sent you the email right now. Oh, good. Okay, I'll check on it later. Okay, that's great. Is everybody happy? Happy, yes. <laughs> we are two hours into this, a little over two hours. Are we happy? Do we Do we have any more serious questions here? Huh? No. no. We're okay? okay? Okay. So let us say our prayer now. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. 
may be grieving, shadow, grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu.